Josh Haston here, Israel Uncensored, on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. It is Monday, the 6th of January, 2020, the 9th of Tevet, 5780. For everyone who celebrated the new year um, on your calendar, hope you had a wonderful and joyous festival. A lot going on here in Israel and the Middle East, and we are going to get right to it. Um, several days ago, U.S. President Donald Trump liquidated the Iranian Revolutionary Guard commander Qasem Soleimani. Rever- reverberations are being felt all over the Middle East, and we are going to go to the phone right now and talk to a top expert on the Islamic world, on Iran. He is a great friend. He's a great friend of the show, Dr. Harold Rode former advisor on Islamic affairs in the office of the Secretary of State in the U.S. Uh, he studied extensively throughout the Islamic world, done research in universities all over the Middle East, has much experience in this field, one of the leading experts on Israel, the Middle East, and the Islamic world here today. Dr. Rowe, thanks so much for joining us here on Israel Uncensored. Thanks, uh, Josh. It's always nice to be with you. Just one thing. I was the Department of Defense, not State Department. They don't like me. We're, <laughs> we, will, we will correct that. The Department of Defense, <laughs> not the State Department. There's a huge difference there, so I apologize for that, <laughs> for that, for that error. <laughs> but okay, um, obviously. Tell me, and this is, uh, you know, obviously uh, major, major news uh, out of our region here, uh, the liquidation of Qasem Soleimani. If you can, tell the listeners the significance of that event, his demise, and specifically, if you can, uh, describe uh, what that means for us sitting here in Israel. Imagine that Qasem Soleimani is the equivalent of General Eisenhower in World War II. Eisenhower ran the entire um, uh, uh, Allied effort against the Nazis um, in Europe. He was he was it, the most important general. And that's what Qasem Soleimani was. He was head of the, um, the uh, Quds Force, the Jerusalem Force, uh, and uh, his fingers were in everything throughout the Middle East. He ran Iranian policy. He was also like a son to the dictator that runs Iran, Khomeini. And to kill him would be like killing the head of American troops. The, the, the American chief of staff, the Ramatal here in Israel. It's devastating is the bottom line. It's devastating for for them. Um, yes. And now, and now you have the Iranians threatening uh, all sorts of things. Uh, they've put a bounty on President Trump's head. They've threatened to attack Israel. All these threats uh, coming out of Iran now. How serious should we take these threats? And uh, if you can, comment on those who said that this was a mistake you do have uh particularly i don't know if you want to call them jewish organizations but they claim to be jewish organizations uh with a heavy liberal slant in the u.s who say that this was uh a declaration of war uh by by the americans and it it was a mistake so if you can comment on both of those please well let's start with the declaration of war the fact is that the Iranian regime, since the Ayatollah Khomeini took over in 1979, they declared war on the United States then, when they came back to Iran. We chose in the West not to hear this and not to understand it that way. The Saudis understood it that way. Um, Saddam Hussein in Iraq understood it that way, but we chose to ignore that. Imagine that one side declares war on you and you say, oh, never mind, I have, a l- I have lunch plans for today. They have told us in the beginning, that's how they see it. There's nothing new. We didn't declare war. Um, or they, you know, they declared war. No, they declared war in the beginning. It, it's always easiest when something bad happens. Try to nip it in the bud. It's like, God forbid, someone has cancer. The sooner you take care of it, the better the chances are to survive it. 
it would have been very good if the United States would have understood this uh, way back in 1979. We refused to. I must say that the Israelis did understand it, and they've understood it all along. Yet at the end of the day, it was it was the Americans who took him out. Do you think that that was the uh, that that is good for Israel? Uh, the fact that the U.S. actually took him out, or does it does it not make a difference? Because at the end of the day, Iran, as a result, as is often the case, and we saw this in the first Gulf War, uh, uh, the U.S. went into Kuwait, and uh, the Iraqis at that time, Saddam Hussein, responded by attacking Israel, and it seems like they're preparing to do the same thing here to to try to punish, I guess, Israel for actions of uh, taken by the U.S. president. Well, when Middle Easterners don't talk, they do. When they talk, um, Josh, you're a good guy. Let's assume that I say there's you and I are having a fight, and I tell a bunch of people who are watching this, hold me back or I'm going to kill this, this, this guy, meaning I'm going to kill you. What I'm really saying is when I open my mouth is uh, uh, um, hold me back because you, Josh, will kill me. I'm afraid. When Iranians, when Arabs start talking and screaming and yelling and threatening, it means they're afraid. That's really what the Iranians are right now. And uh, they have not been able to read Trump, which is a very good thing in the Middle East. And they have, uh, uh, they have a bunch of people who work for them in Washington, including the former Secretary of State, Kerry, a, who uh, they advise the Iranian government. They, they, and these people have been saying to the, uh, their advisors in Washington have been saying, hold on, we Democrats are going to win in 2020 and then we will make things, we'll give in to you just like Obama gave in to you in the past. Now, uh, what the Iranians are seeing is that some of the advice that they're getting doesn't seem to work. Trump took out the most important Iranian military figure in Qasem Soleimani. And uh, he basically told the Iranians, okay, yeah, you want to up the ante? Fine, we're going to go after 52 different targets within Iran. And good luck to you. Uh, we don't want to take over the country. We don't want to destroy you. But if this is what you're going to, if, if you make any problems for us or any of our allies, that includes Israel, Saudi Arabia, or whatever, uh, we're going to we're going to take care of you. And we've just shown you that we can and we will. We have both the ability and the will to do it. And we will. The Iranians are scared. They don't know what to do. On the other hand, if they do not react, they look weak in the eyes of their own people. And if they look weak in the eyes of their own people in the Middle East, when someone is weak, you don't feel sorry for them. You pounce on them. And so the Iranian government is between a rock and a hard place. Good luck to them, and maybe the people of Iran will be able to eventually liberate their country from the tyranny, from the terrorists who are running it. Yeah, that would that would be the uh, the ultimate proof uh, in the justice of the, of the Trump administration's actions. If in fact it leads to that uh, scenario where the people of Iran are are freed, um, at the same time there were reports last night of rockets being fired at or near uh, the U.S. Uh, embassy there in Baghdad. Do you have the latest on those attacks? Um, and uh, perhaps uh, you could share, and again, I don't know if anybody really knows uh, how Trump might respond as a result of, of these attacks. Maybe you can uh, fill us in on what exactly happened last night uh, in Baghdad. Well, I know in general, I don't know in specific, and I can tell you that most of the media all talks to themselves and they haven't a clue what's going on in the ground, on the ground in, in Baghdad. The, uh, what the Iranians wanted to do is take over the American embassy in Baghdad, just as they took over the American embassy in the beginning of the Iranian revolution in 1979. <laughs> And uh, uh, they failed because America, uh, shall we say, President Trump did not like, act like President Jimmy Carter, which was to give in to everything, or President Obama, who gave in even more than Jimmy Carter. Uh, President Trump stood up. Now, uh, 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 they can fire rockets. And you said something, and Josh, I don't know this. 
But if the rockets came near but didn't attack, that's an, uh, that's an idea of, oh, I'm going to try to hurt you, but, but not really because I'm really afraid if I do something that could blow me to smithereens. What the Iranians are exhibiting is fear. We are nearly out of time. We're on the phone with Dr. Harold Rode, advisor on Islamic affairs in the office of the Secretary of Defense. Just last Retired. question. Did I get that right? Retired. Retired. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just, just last question again. I mean, it seems today here, sitting in Jerusalem, that it's that it's business as usual. And uh, I know over the weekend they closed the Khermon ski resort up in the north, fearing perhaps uh, retaliation. Um, but the Khermon is now open. It's business as usual throughout the country. Um, in your estimation, I know you can't predict the future. But uh, from where you're sitting, do you think uh, it will be business as usual here in Israel in the days, weeks, months ahead? A lot of people want to know and are concerned about the situations developing around us. I'm not a prophet, and the age of prophecy, as far as I know, is over. But um, I think Israel has an extremely good idea of what goes on in the Iranian mines. They have an intelligence network inside of Iran, bar none. Uh, they and uh, President Trump and the great Prime Minister Netanyahu work together. Uh, it's sort of seamless. It's fantastic to watch. And uh, uh, I can't know what the Iranians are going to do. I can only say one thing. The people running Iran believe they're a strange group of people. Even the Ayatollah Khomeini, who founded the Islamic government, hated them. Because they believe, the present rulers of Iran, that if there is a conflagration, that they can provoke their Messiah, the Mahdi, to come and save them. And uh, that means that a conflagration is an incentive for them. But I believe, as much as I can know this, that both the United States and Israel are very, very well prepared for any eventuality and uh i can't know the future but uh i am not worried i'm here in israel i'm not running anywhere i'm not either and uh, ladies and gentlemen i hope you're taking this all in we are talking to one of the top figures in the world today one of the top <laughs> experts on the islamic world he's laughing there but it's really the case Islamic world in the Middle East, Dr. Harold Rode, former advisor on Islamic affairs in the office of the Secretary of Defense of the United States. I want to thank you so much for your unique insight and analysis on everything going on here in Israel and the Middle East. And uh, I have a feeling we're going to be talking again soon as the situation develops and uh, we'll have to see what happens. I want to thank you so much for your time. You said you were here in Jerusalem, so welcome back to Jerusalem. It's great to have you as always, and it's a great uh, it's a great pleasure to have you on the show. Josh, I believe in you. I believe in what you're doing. Anytime I can help, I'm happy to. I appreciate that. We are going to take a short break and be right back with everything else going on in the news here in Israel and throughout the Middle East. My name is Josh Haston. This is Israel Uncensored. On the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. Don't forget, you can always get in touch with me during the week, Josh at thelandofisrael.com, on Facebook, Joshua Haston, or Josh Haston Israel Advocacy and Journalism, on Twitter at Josh Haston, and now on Instagram as well. We'll take a short break for station identification and come right back with much, much more. Don't go anywhere. This week on Inside Israel Today with Gil Hoffman. An exclusive interview with former Israeli ambassador to the U.S., Michael Oren, on the rash of anti-Semitic attacks in America. Those attacks on Jews in New York is not isolated incidents, but part of a national scourge that has to be confronted, and not just by putting policemen in front of synagogues. For the full interview, check out Inside Israel Today with Gil Hoffman every Tuesday on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. And we are back, Josh Haston here, Israel Uncensored on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com, coming to you from Jerusalem on this Monday, the 6th of January, 2020, the 9th of Tevet, 5780. So as we were discussing here, the whole situation involving taking out of 
General Qasem Soleimani, reported here by various news agencies. Uh, his body arrived Sunday in Iran to throngs of mourners after the U.S. drone strike killed the Iranian commander as U.S. President Donald Trump threatened to hit Iran harder than ever before if Tehran retaliates to the assassination. Um, death to America, they chanted on mass gathering in the streets of the southwestern city of Avaz, where his remains arrived in Iraq before uh, his funeral scheduled for uh, Tuesday. Footage of the event showed crowds gathering with flags in green, white, and red, depicting the blood of so-called martyrs. Men and women wept as they beat their chests to the sound of Shiite Muslim chants. Now, let's let's remember there were, well, these people were, were mourning, or perhaps they were uh, forced to mourn by the Iranians. We saw plenty of other images throughout the Middle East of people who were celebrating the death of this monster. So let's not think that... Uh, uh, people were just mourning. There were plenty of people whose family members were murdered by this uh, barbarian who were are quite happy with President Trump and uh, his action in taking this guy out. Again, the funeral on Tuesday. Iran promising harsh revenge. Rockets launched uh, at Baghdad on Saturday, Saturday night and also Sunday night as well. Um towards the American embassy there. And I do not have official confirmation in terms of the, the, uh, the damage done by those rockets, but rockets were launched. Trump wrote, President Trump wrote on Twitter afterwards that, quote, if they attack again, which I would strongly advise them not to do, we will hit them harder than they have ever been hit before. He followed up with another tweet saying the U.S. would use its, quote, brand new, beautiful military equipment without hesitation of the Iran- if the Iranians retaliate. He also threatened to target 52 Iranian sites, uh, representing 52 American hostages taken by Iran years ago. And Trump did did not identify those targets, added that they would be, in caps, hit very fast and very hard. And his tweets continued on uh, Sunday night as well, even saying that he would use uh, disproportionate force in order to take out the Iranians. Trump isn't playing games, folks. He is not playing games here with the Iranians. In Israel here, some precautions were taken. Uh, The Hermon um, ski resort was closed the other day, but today on Monday it is open for the season. People are up there enjoying the snow, but it was closed there for a while. Uh, Certain precautions taken at foreign missions who were targets by the Iranians in the past. So that is uh, how Israel is involved. Um, the, U- the U.S. has ordered all citizens to leave Iraq and temporarily closing its embassy in Baghdad. Don't mess with President Donald Trump. That is the bottom line in this little story. If you're going to fire rockets, you're going to try to kill Americans, attack property of uh, the United States, you will pay. And um, some of the craziness of this whole this whole story is how, while this uh, Soleimani was an evil, evil person, how... Some Jews and Jewish organizations spoke out against what the president did, ignoring ignoring those so-called human rights organizations or left-wing organizations, ignoring the fact that this guy was a murderer and murdered Muslims, many, many Muslims, thousands of Muslims, in addition to targeting U.S. troops and targeting Israel. But, you know, are these, how are these Jewish organizations speaking out against the fact that there's less evil in the world and this person who targeted Muslims and caused great suffering among many Muslims was taken out. How can they be complaining about that? But yet they are. Here's uh, somebody who has a strong moral compass, Julian or Julian uh, Reichelt, the editor-in-chief of the best-selling German newspaper. I believe it's pronounced Bild. He authored a barn-burning commentary this is uh, reported by the Jerusalem Post praising President Trump for authorizing a military strike to eliminate uh, Soleimani. President Trump has freed the world of a monster whose aim in life was an atomic cloud over Tel Aviv, said the, uh, said the writer. Trump has acted in self-defense, the self-defense of the U.S. and all peace-loving people, wrote Reich, uh, Reichelt, if that, that's how it's pronounced. So you, you do have people who get it. 
and the editor here of this newspaper in Germany, uh, he gets it. I wish uh, many others uh, would get it as well. The title of the commentary was Trump has freed the world from a monster. So there are people who understand why this was just, why this was necessary. And uh, it's good to see there are people out there, and uh, especially in a place like Germany, who actually get it. Uh, in other news here, we had a rally in Jerusalem yesterday uh, outside the Jewish Agency for Israel's offices against anti-Semitism. This in uh, coordination or at the same time as the No, Fear, no Hate, No Fear rally was taking place in uh, New York and Manhattan and in Brooklyn, organized by the UJA Federation of New York. So I saw some of the images uh, there yesterday, the thousands of people out in the streets. I do, def uh, I do, however, question the fact that you had um, some shady characters there, those who have uh, stood up against Israel, um, members of the squad and whatnot who participated in the rally, and groups like J Street who participated and, um, you know, you can't one day be anti-Israel, be blatantly anti-Israel, and then the next day come out and, and speak out against anti-Semitism. Because as we know, and if, if you ask the German parliament, they will tell you anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. It's one and the same. So if you come out and you spew your anti-Zionism, which is really, again, anti-Semitism anti -Semitism in disguise, don't come out to a rally and pretend that you are against anti that you are against the uh, Jew hatred when you yourself are part of the problem. So that's my issue with some of those who participated in this rally yesterday. Uh, speaking of one of these organizations, I'm not a fan of uh, J Street. The co-founder of J Street, Joel Rubin, uh, he was also the deputy assistant secretary of state under President Obama. He was chosen by Bernie Sanders, the Democratic candidate for president as its liaison to the Jewish community. So that, that says a lot about who Bernie Sanders is and what type of campaign he will be leading and what type of policies he will implement if he is president now that he's picked the co-founder of J Street to be his uh, liaison to the Jewish community. Back in September, Rubin supported uh, Rashida Tlaib and Ilan Omar after Israel refused to let them enter. Um, he told Fox News, no, the squad is not anti-Semitic. Yeah, right. Um, that, that is his, uh, th these are his positions uh, on this, despite everything that the squad has said publicly about Israel and uh, the anti-Semitic tropes used by, by members of the squad. So uh, the Jewish press says here, expect more Bernie Sanders endorsements of I'm not anti-Semitic, just anti-Zionist politicians. That's a commentary there by the Jewish press. Again, anti-Semitism masked as anti-Zionism. Expect more of that. Some of those endorsements from uh, the Bernie Sanders camp. Um, so you got to think about who you're voting for if you're a Democrat. If you're somehow still a Democrat, despite where the party is uh, today compared to where it was years ago, especially in regard to its uh, lack of support uh, policies and lack of support of, uh, of Israel and the Jewish people. The Jerusalem Post reports that Yaffa Yisachar, whose daughter Nama is currently be held, being held in a Russian prison, uh, will physically uh, block a Russian delegation led by Putin from entering President Ruby Rivlin's home on an upcoming visit. President uh, uh, Putin is scheduled to visit Israel on January 23rd as part of the Fifth World Holocaust Forum to be held at Yad Vashem, and he's to meet with Israel, Israel's top officials. So Yaffa Yisachar says that she will physically block Putin from uh, entering the meet and, meeting with Israel's President Rivlin. Now, if you remember, now Ma is being held in a Russian jail on drug smuggling charges, even though she only had a small amount of marijuana, which many people believe, and... Isachar, the Sahar family claims the Russians planted on her for political reasons, wanting to free a Russian national, Alexei Burkov, who was arrested in Israel and extradited to the U.S., who was suspected of credit card fraud. So again, the story here of the Russians holding this poor girl and uh, her sentence is for seven and a half years, even though she could have gotten, even if she, let's say the marijuana was hers, 
the small amount would have been a essentially a, a misdemeanor or a slap on the wrist. But they are holding her political hostage in Russia, and her mother says that Israel should not be welcoming uh, Putin, and Israel should be doing everything possible to have her daughter released. And I and you know one of the biggest mitzvot in the Torah is the redemption of the captives. And this, I would say, applies. I'm not a Torah scholar, but I would say this falls under that category as one of our Israelis is being held captive in a Russian prison cell. People need to know about that. Um, Finishing the show with with a couple positive and good news stories. The Jerusalem Post says that the under six, that's right, under six years old Israeli chess championship was held last week in Rishon LeZion. The competition is being has been held every year for the past, every year for the past twelve years. It invites un, children under the age of six to compete against other top Israeli youth in chess. It's estimated that as of 2020, more than 10,000 Israeli children in kindergarten and first grade study or play chess in some capacity. That's unbelievable. Just shows you uh, the type of kids we have here in the land of Israel. The brains that we have here. These are kids that are six years old who are competing in chess. This is absolutely brilliant. And finally, you all know I'm a big fan of rainy winters here. Or if you don't know, if you're a first-time listener, I love the winter. I love the cold. I love the rain. And it's great to see that we had another rainy weekend. And unfortunately, there were some tragedies. Also, people were were killed as a result of the storms that we don't want to see a horrible story. And I said, this was going to be good news. So I don't want to focus on this, but a horrible story of, of, of two people who are trapped in an elevator who, who, who were, who were killed as a result of floodwaters, just terrible. But on the positive side, the Kinneret rose another five centimeters since Thursday, the Lake of Galilee is on the rise. It has risen 42 centimeters in total since the beginning of the current rainy season sits two meters and 68 centimeters below the upper red line, which is considers, considered to be the lake's maximum capacity. And it's not over yet. More rain is expected here in this area of the country in Jerusalem on Wednesday. I think it might even be, still be rainy up in northern Israel. But uh, let's hope for Gishmei uh, Brachaz. They say rain of blessing. There shouldn't be any of those tragedies. The Kinneret should rise, and it should only be for good. And we should continue to receive the rain we desperately need here in the state of Israel, in the land of Israel. That's going to do it for today. Big shout out to Benjamin Bresky, engineer extraordinaire. Also to Tab- Tabitha Epstein for the work she does behind the scenes here at the Land of Israel Network. If you have any feedback, please get in touch with me. Comments, questions, if you want me to read your emails on the air, happy to do so. My name is Josh Haston. This has been another edition of Israel Uncensored on the Land of Israel Network. At thelandofisrael.com, coming to you from Jerusalem here on the 6th of January, 2020, 9th of Tevet, 5780. Get in touch with me during the week, Josh, at thelandofisrael.com. Facebook, Joshua Haston, or my page, Josh Haston, Israel Advocacy and Journalism. On Twitter, at Josh Haston, and on Instagram as well. Everyone out there in the wonderful world of ours, be safe. Shalom, shalom from a sunny but cold and beautiful Jerusalem, capital of the Jewish people for all eternity. Shalom. He who reigns within himself, says John Milton, and rules passions, desires, and fears, is more than a king. I'd like to believe I have quite a grip on myself, though I can't claim any royal descent. I'm Rav Mike Foyer, and this is The Jewish Story. Join Rav Mike Foyer for the best Jewish history podcast, The Jewish Story, on the Land of Israel Network at the